Ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues and friends, I would like to focus my presentation on a, poli on a policy brief uh, that was authored by a group of experts from the OECD and from the International Panel on Social Progress. But I will also mention other briefs which were prepared in the task force on global inequality and social cohesion that I had the uh, honor to uh, co-chair with uh, Elmut Anayer and uh, Gianluca Grimalda. So I invite you to browse this, uh, this collective work on the G20 Insights webpage. In a globalized and uh, digitalized world that offers great opportunities to many, but can also, as we just heard, leave many people behind, social inclusion is a challenge. And it is also a necessity, as mentioned by previous speakers. Peoples of the world in recent years have voiced signals of discontent that need to be answered promptly and effectively. To address this challenge, our vision of inclusive growth, which is broadly consistent with the Agenda 2030, has relied on three pillars. The first pillar is that inclusive growth is about enhancing well-being for all. What does this mean? Inclusive growth is not just about income distribution. It's about improving a wide range of outcomes uh, that matter for well-being, such as employment opportunities, uh, job satisfaction, health, uh, social inclusion, and non-discrimination, and so on. The question of migrants is also central for uh, the question of uh, for the issue of social integration. For instance, there is a strong consensus on that the uh, job creation issue is very important, but jobs are much more important than just the income they provide to uh, to people because of the, they are important because of the well-being implications they carry through social status, uh, self-esteem, and so on. And the quality of jobs should not be neglected for the for the sake of fighting unemployment. Uh, creating more and better jobs requires tackling labor market duality and segmentation and minimizing the risks that vulnerable youth will be uh, permanently left behind. The second pillar is that inclusive growth requires the participation of people in collective decisions. Inclusive growth is not only about outcomes and opportunities, but also about processes. It requires making citizens feel respected and able to participate in the decisions that affect their lives. There is now a day, unfortunately, a perceived lack of legitimacy in the way that globalization has been taken forward. And I could say a widespread sense that selfish and greedy elites have broken the social contract. The left behind actually are not begging for a welfare stipend. They primarily want dignity and to be in control of their lives. The third pillar is that policies for inclusive growth require an integrated approach. Uh, addressing the multidimensional nature of well-being and inequalities and lifting outcomes and opportunities to, for those that accumulate the disadvantages uh, effectively requires uh, uh, defining packages of, of policies in contrast with the traditional uh, silo uh, approach. Well-being, participation, integrated approach, these are the three pillars. Now I would like to describe how these general ideas can be implemented in concrete policies at the national and the international level. The uh, national level is important even in the context of the G20 because coordination of national economic and social policies is, uh, is uh, key to boosting their feasibility and also their, their effectiveness. So let me start with the national level where policies can intervene in four areas. The first policy area is about preparing people for life and supporting them in life. Many public policies, often viewed as expenses, are actually investments and should be evaluated as and measured as such. Uh, two policy items stand out in particular. First, universal access to quality public goods and services, in particular health and education, uh, as well as infrastructure, especially for emerging economies. Um, education, including lifelong education, is particularly uh, central. And the second point is, ex the second item is expanding social protection, in particular by reducing inequal access between regular workers and, and non-regular workers, if I may say, including workers from the informal economy or the sharing economy. The second policy area at the national level is about enhancing the equity and effectiveness of taxes and transfers. Many countries have room for making their tax and transfer systems more equitable, in particular by reducing regressive tax breaks and uh, making better use of inheritance uh, taxation, as was advocated in particular by the late Tony Atkinson. And at the same time, taxes and transfers can be made more efficient, promoting job creation, labor-friendly technical innovation, and environmental preservation. How? Well, by reducing distortionary taxation of labor and shifting toward environmental and rent taxation. Otmar Edenhofer and co-authors have a policy brief uh, on the opportunities offered by the shift of the, of the tax base. 
The third policy area is about improving governance in the economic, political, and social sphere. As I said, we are undergoing a crisis of governance, including at the national level. So countries should uh, enhance social dialogue between all relevant stakeholders to promote an inclusive education system as well as an inclusive labor market, and perhaps lessons from the Scandinavian model uh, can be uh, taken here. They should encourage inclusive corporate governance for the well-being of all stakeholders and support the social and solidarity sector that generates positive uh, social externalities and um, enhance um, civic participation. Um, and um, they should monitor campaign and party funding as well as the funding and governance of the media in order to avoid political capture and restore trust in these institutions. And they should, uh, last but not least, measure and evaluate policy outcomes. Notable progress has been made in the last decades on the measurement of income issues and wealth as well, uh, but much remains to be done for the non-monetary aspects of people's life. Overcoming data limitations is really key for policy effectiveness and also for accountability. And the fourth policy area is about promoting gender equality and the integration of minorities. So gender equality is really very important and there are many tools, including public services like childcare and so on, that can really empower women. And as for migrants, um, I can just mention that we, we, can, we should lower uh, barriers to employability and develop perhaps educational and awareness campaigns to reduce discrimination and change people's attitudes. Let me now move to the uh, international level, which is central in G20 work. Like one can identify three policy areas which are crucial for <coughs> inclusive development. First policy area, pursue cooperation on issues of global common interests, such as tax evasion and corporate taxation, climate policies, migrations, and so on. Second policy area, enhance the institutional tools for global rulemaking and implementation by re-examining the relationship between trade agreements and both labor and environmental standards, perhaps, and enhancing the role of international organizations in global governance. And the third policy area is about developing global dialogue and exchange of good practices in areas such as corporate governance, competition policy, and so on, and involving not just governments, but also civil society networks. Let me stop here. It's important to, uh, to uh, bring civil society in the picture, and we have uh, several policy briefs on this issue, and there will be a special workshop tomorrow on this question. So in conclusion, let me just once again join the chorus of voices here and elsewhere, pointing to the emergency of the situation, lest we promptly find ways to make growth more inclusive nationally and uh, globally the sustainability, I should perhaps even say the mere survival of our societies is jeopardized. Thank you very much. <laughs>